Hi, uh, this is Muro. I haven't been doing a video in English for a long time, so I want to do that today. Um, actually, the talk before my last session in Antaich was mostly in English. Unfortunately, the storage of the camera was full after 20 minutes, and until then I had spoken uh, mostly in Japanese. So those of you who follow this account on YouTube are probably still waiting for that English talk that I promised. And I gave the talk, but unfortunately, well, it's uh, not in the camera. So I want to recapture uh, some things that I said uh, in that talk on September 30th in Antaiji before the session. I've been for several years now uh, talking about the Gyoji chapter of the Shobo Genzo each month before the session. Um, Gyoji, the title of the chapter can be translated as maintaining the practice, practice, maintaining practice, or it uh, also can be translated Nishijima, I think does that is um, Pure conduct and I'm not quite sure. Practice and conduct, something like that. So uh, Nishijima prefers to translate Jo and she separately. Um, but I think it's the more natural way to take this as a unit, uh, not practice and conduct, but maintaining. Uh, the practice. It's a chapter that Dogen wrote towards the end of his time in Kyoto when he was still living in Kosholji in Uji, but he already knew that he was probably moving up into the mountains of Eheji. But uh, I could imagine that he had doubts, he had still doubts, um, if it was the right thing to do and if he had the strength to do it. In the capital, he had supporters, he had a big audience. And it was easy for him to have uh, students visit him. Mm, he could have exchange with his peers in the Buddhist community. And moving up uh, to Eheji to build that temple somewhere deep in the mountains, where the climate uh, can be hard on you. It's cold in the winter, lots of snow. Mm, can't be sure what provisions you will have there. Uh, it's far away from the capital. Mm, so a good part of this Gyoji chapter, maintaining the practice, consists of story of the old patriarchs, how they endured hardships, the cold, uh, not much food. And they did it solely for the practice and no other goal than that. And the section I talked about before the session in Japanese, uh, that part is called Gion Shogi and it, it's pretty famous because it's also part of this uh, Sutra book um, that monks chant in training monasteries. Um, it's the section where Dogen Zenshi talks about the patriarch uh, Fuyo Dokai. As, his, the name, as the name is pronounced in Japanese. At the end of the section, um, there's a small poem uh, by Fuyo Dokai that you also find written on our wooden board that we hit before Zazen. Uh, that poem consists of the following lines. From our mountain fields, millet harvested for our meal. From our garden, plain yellow leeks. Whether you eat from what there is to eat is up to you. And if you choose not to eat thereof, feel free to go wherever you will. I pray that on reflection, each of you, my companions on the path, will practice diligently. Take good care of yourselves. Um, I read this from the Shasta Abbey translation. There's a PDF version on the internet and you find this at the bottom of page 426. 
So that's basically also the philosophy of Antaiji. We eat whatever we have to eat at the season. Mm, in autumn, usually there's enough, but sometimes, especially in the spring, when all the resources during the winter have been used up and there's no fresh vegetables yet in the field, um, sometimes there's not so much to eat. Um, and the life is maybe not as people imagined it would be when they first came to Antaiji. So some people decide to leave and that's up to them. Or if you stay, then eat what you find on the table. And for many people also the surprise, and it's not only vegetables, but it could be a boar, it could be deer, stuff that was donated by hunters. Uh, you find that on the table as well. If you're not okay with that, go somewhere else uh, where people cater to your diet. If you're okay with that, eat it and sit and work. And because it was the talk before the session, I said a few things about the session. For example, um, Mm, one reason why I like this translation, maintaining the practice, is because you emphasize that practice is not a blitz effort. It's not that you practice for a week wholeheartedly and then you get something. It's also not that you practice three years when you're young and then for the rest of your life your problems will be solved. But practice is a day-to-day -day thing. Um, Uchiyama Roshi used to say that you can't keep Satori in the refrigerator. Uh, you have to refresh it every day anew. It doesn't keep. And the same is true for practice. You can't keep it in the refrigerator. You have to refresh it from day to day. And at Antaiji, uh, we have these monthly sessions from the 1st to the 5th of each month. And we sit... Um, 15 periods uh, a day, first five from four to nine, then there's breakfast and then we sit again from 10 to three. We have a second meal in the afternoon and then from four to five, another five periods. And the fifth day, um, the session ends at three o'clock. So altogether it's 70 periods, which is quite a lot, it can be quite demanding. Um, but if you've got your mind set on the practice and you're willing to do it, um, the first day is not so easy, but you can do it for 15 hours, 15 periods of them, it's possible. But then uh, somewhere around the 25th period, so in the afternoon of the second day, it gets really painful. And it gets even worse than when you remind yourself of the fact that you're only through the first third of the session. It gets worse from then. And then one day later, at the end of the third day, it might feel as if you're in hell. But the bad news is it's only half through. You're only th half through the session. What can you do? Um, the best day is not uh, the best thing you can do is not to count the periods that are still ahead of you. Don't count the periods. Just sit for one period at a time. Just like Georgi maintaining the practices of one day at a time practice. During session, it becomes a one period at a time. Sit each period as if it was the last. I have only this one last period of Sazen. Give your whole to this period of Sazen. And sometimes even that doesn't work anymore. Um, people are not supposed to bring their watches to Sazen, so you sometimes lose track of time but there's one uh, guy who's responsible of hitting the bell who has a clock uh, with which he checks the time usually there's a small clock sitting in front of that guy and if you're sitting somewhere close to that person sometimes you can kind of stretch your neck and, and take a 
peek at the clock to see how many minutes there are. You think that the bell must be ringing any minute now, it must be ringing any minute. And if you check, if you check the clock and you see, oh, it's another two minutes, then you feel relieved. Okay, two minutes, I can do that. Another two minutes. But sometimes this happens, you, you take a look at the watch and you thought, you thought maybe it's another two minutes, maybe three, but actually it's 30. You go, you go, wow, that can't be true. It can't be another 30 minutes. How is that possible? How can I possibly survive another 30 minutes? So interestingly, the same pain, the same pain changes the moment you know it's another two minutes or it's another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so the best thing is, of course, to not look at the clock, but to sit only for one minute at a time. Don't even think about sitting for the whole period. So ask yourself, can I sit for another minute? Or maybe another second. Can I sit for another second? And usually the answer is yes, one second is possible. And then you do that. And then you sit another second. And another second. And another second. And after 2,700 seconds, the bell will ring. And you do these 2,700 seconds 70 times and the session is over. And if you forget about all the other seconds, all the other times, and just do one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, eventually, eventually you will be able to let go. Um, one part in this um, part on Fuyo Dokai or the talk that he gives to his students and Dogen Zenji quotes this talk that I find is especially interesting well in Japanese um, it reads Tada nanji ga kokoro o shiryosen koto o yosu which I would translate as the only thing that's important the only thing that's necessary is that your mind dies off. You need to bury your mind. You have to, well, kill your mind in a way. Um, for some reason in the Nishijima translation he has here only um, Sekiso, well, before that, uh, Dogen or Fuyodoka is talking about a, a guy called Sekiso who lived in a hut. Sekiso established a withered tree hall where he sat and slept with the monks, wanting only to master his own mind. Um, it's not a wrong translation, mastering the mind, but, but basically the original words are much stronger. Uh, the mind has to die would be the original word and the word nanji usually means you of course it can also refer to one's own phenomenal self so Sekiso maybe was also talking about himself here or meaning that he needs to die but I think that here the Shasta Abbott's translation is closer uh, they translated as Sekiso built a hall for withered trees where he and his community did their sitting and lying down, only requiring of his monks that their hearts and minds completely quiet down. So of course he would require, the, his, require this from himself, but also from his monks. And the point is that we have to do that ourselves, as well as said in this poem at the end of the section. I pray that on reflection each of you, my companions on the path, will practice diligently. So what does it mean to practice diligently? You have
have to die on the cushion. Um, I often tell the story of how I first got to Antaiji 30 years ago. It was just right after the strong uh, typhoon that had washed away the path to the bus stop. So when I got off at the closest bus stop, which is still five kilometers from the temple, there was no path. And some of the monks had come down to Antaiji and we were climbing this mountain of mud, basically. Trees had fallen and, and the, uh, the typhoon had washed down parts of the mountain. And when I arrived at Antaiji first, they uh, invited me to have a bath. When I opened the lid of the bath, it was completely black liquid in there because of the typhoon where the water was completely diluted even in the kitchen and after the bath i was invited by the abbot uh, to share some tea with them and when i looked at the tea it was also suspiciously brown dark but i didn't really have time to worry about that because the first thing he would ask me is why are you here why have you come to antaji and I said, I've come here to learn something about Buddhism. And he said, we are not a school. This is not a school here. You create Antaiji. And at first that blew me away because I was only 22 years old. I just arrived from Germany. How can I create Antaiji? How am I supposed to do that? But it also felt encouraging that he would say that to somebody that just arrived. You create Antaiji. Three years later, when I was 25, I had ordained as a monk. I was standing in the kitchen for the first time, uh, trying to prepare udon noodles. I didn't know how to prepare these noodles. I did them spaghetti al dente style, and the Japanese monks didn't like them because they were too hard for them. Uh, they said, well, in Japan, these udon noodles should be a little softer. So the next day I decided, okay, if you want them softer, I'll make them soft for you. And I cooked them for 30 minutes and it became a udon gruel. They all dissolved. And I thought, can't be such a big problem. I mean, you can chew them, you can drink it as soup your stomach will digest them either way. But the Japanese monks didn't like the way I cooked the noodles. They didn't like most of my food. So every day I got criticism for what I did in the kitchen. And one day I said, hey, come on, I'm not here to learn how to cook. I'm here to practice Buddhism. I'm here to learn something about Zen. And when the abbot, my teacher, heard that, he said, it's not about you. You don't count at all. And at first I was very surprised. Why would he say that? Didn't he say in the beginning, you create Antaji? If I create Antaji, it must be about me. How can he say now, out of a sudden, that I don't count at all? Yeah, probably he should have told, told me earlier, probably he should have told me right from the start that I don't give myself up, uh, I will have a very hard time creating Antaji. Um, also, I tell the story from time to time about, well, this realization on the third day of session, this is hell, this is killing me. What can I do? I'm giving my best already and it's still not enough. I'm dying, I'm dying. And maybe you ask your teacher, what does the teacher say? Don't worry. Don't worry, we have a graveyard behind the meditation hall. If you die, everything's gonna be taken care of. No problem, just die. And it sounds like a black joke, but 
if you get to the point where you have no other choice than well leaving the monastery or giving it a chance and saying okay maybe maybe my gonna grave is gonna be here maybe uh, my grave is gonna stand behind the meditation hall but it's not the worst place it's a nice place to be buried why not and when you get to that point it gets easy usually it gets easy after that because you don't have to grind your teeth anymore you don't have to move around on your cushion anymore you don't have to fight you don't have to escape it's a little bit like this uh, quote from some Tibetan Lama, I forgot the name, but uh, there's this famous quote, you can find it probably on the internet. Um, the bad news is you're falling and you don't have a parachute. The good news is there's no ground to hit. You thought for moments, for a second you were dying. But when you accepted that, okay, let it be, you realize, no, no, I'm not dying, I'm actually alive. I'm actually alive. And the pain is still there, but it's not killing me. It's part of the scenery of the Zen, it's part of what I am. I don't have to eliminate the pain, I don't have to put up with the pain, I don't have to fight the pain, I don't have to escape the pain, I just sit here with the pain and everything else. The Zen sits the Zen. I think that's the point that um, Seki So and Fuyodokai uh, talk about when they say that, well, the only thing that's important, the only thing that it takes is that your mind completely dies. You have to die. The question, of course, is, and that's also a question that uh, one of the participants asked after my talk, uh, before the session, how can I do it? How can you do this? Because everybody, everyone who tried that probably knows you can't do it. You can't do it. You cannot kill your own mind. You cannot, through your own effort, die on the cushion. You cannot force yourself to let go. There's always this... this talk about letting go and letting go which basically in the end it means the same thing it sounds a little bit softer than dying but basically when we say letting go in Zen we mean this dying you die on the cushion in the rice field at the table while cleaning the corridor you completely let go of yourself but that's not something you can do. How can you do it? How does it happen? Mm. Well, what often happens during session or other parts, other times in the, in the, in the practice is you, you approach this edge of an abyss and at one point you feel I'm standing at the abyss, at the, at the edge, but you don't want to fall. You don't want to make this extra step so what you do is well you retreat you make a couple of steps back but you don't feel good about yourself when you do that you don't want to make the steps back so what you do is you go forward again until you're at the edge and you go back again and then you go forward again and you retreat and you go back forward again um, at one point you get tired of yourself but still I mean how can you make this last step how can you make it I think 
well, the only thing you can do, you cannot really force yourself to make this step. But what you can do is you can refuse to make this backward step. You can also refuse to try to fight the pain. That, that's usually this, the temptation or these, these two things that we, we try to do. We want to fight something that's impossible to win against the pain or the suffering in our, our life. Either we fight it, we ground our teeth, or we try to escape it. Fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. And usually during session, that, that's what we do from second to second. Fight until we can't fight anymore and then we try to escape. And then if we are tired of escaping, we try to make another effort and fight. But you don't have to do it. You can, to stop, you can stop that. You can stop it for a second and then another second and another second and another second and another second. And one point at one point, you don't have another choice to go off that edge. Unless you step backwards again, but you don't have to step backwards. As long as you refuse the temptation to do so. Um, one thing that explained, uh, I explained before the session, I've been explaining for a number of times now, I think also in English, is um, like if somebody would ask me, what do we do um, during Zazen? Or when we practice one way to put it is uh, practicing the Zen means to quit that game that we've been playing ever since we learned how to say you and me maybe when we we're two three four years old ever since then when we realized actually my mother and my father are different from me and I have other siblings. I'm only one out of many. We've been playing this game comparing ourselves to the others and we're living in this world where me, I'm at the center of this world but there are other people around and I'm comparing myself with the others and I try to collect points and win in this game against them. I try to win most attention from my parents. I try to be better than my brother and my sister. I try to excel at school to be maybe not the best in class, but at least above the average. Then if we become teenagers, we try to be popular with the girls or with the boys. We want to be loved. We want to be at the center of attention. But for some reason, hardly anyone seems to accept that we are actually at the center of the universe. Maybe at the beginning, our mother or our father give us this impression, the illusion that we are actually at the center of the universe. But then if we have siblings, we have to realize I'm not the only center. There, there can only one, be only one center of the universe, but these guys around me that are supposedly only supporting actors in this movie that is about me, they all seem to think that they are the center of the universe, which they are obviously not. I'm the center of the universe. They are only the supporting actors in the movie. How come that they also? Um, pretend to be the center of the universe. So we learn to make compromises and at least, well, give the others also the impression, hey, you're also the center of the universe. I like you, I love you, so please love me back. You need to like me back. Uh, we are playing this game that actually I'm playing right now when I'm talking into the camera and later I'm gonna upload that and from time to time, I'm probably going to check how many people 
looked at the video, how many views I got, how many likes I got, are there any thumbs down, uh, who could that possibly be that, that gave me a thumb down, what did they not like in my video, how come I didn't get as many views as say Red Warner, how come that he's more popular on YouTube than me. Um, I'm playing that game. I'm playing that game when I'm sitting here and I'm introducing myself as Muho. Um, but Muho, I'm only here when I'm sitting here and playing this person, interacting with you who are also persons. And each of us believes that we are at the center of the universe but somehow we can't be there as long as we interact as persons. So what do we do during the Zen? We quit this game. Quitting that game means you realize, okay, I'm this person there that has a name at the center of the universe, but there's also another me that doesn't have a name. That would be here. The me that contains all of that. The me that is aware of the game and at one point started to identify only with this person at the center of the game. But actually it's more than that. It's everything. It's everything that's happening right now. And the Muho seems to be at the center of this game, but actually what is happening here right now is the reality of a me that doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a name. So quitting the game means to return to this reality that actually we never left. Whenever we hear a sound, we see a form. We do it here. That's the reality. That's the reality to which people woke up when they say saw a plum blossom in the spring. Until then, he's the person probably thought, "Oh, that's a nice plum blossom there up in the tree," and maybe not quite as beautiful as they were last spring, but uh, it's, it's it's nice. Uh, would be nice to have some rice wine here tonight with my friends. And at one point that guy just sees the plum blossom and realizes here is where the universe is created. In this moment, the universe is created. Or you hear the sound of a pebble hitting a bamboo. Until then, it was just a pebble hitting a bamboo that maybe you uh, threw there when, when cleaning the stone path. And at that moment, it's just the sound. And in that moment, the universe is created. God says, let there be light. And you realize that's not something that happened thousands or billions of years ago. It's, what's happening right now. Let there be light and I'm the one that who sees the light. The universe is created here in this moment. Um, so that's what I mean when, say, when I say Zazen means to quit the game. Um, the Muho that I play, that would be in the Hanya Shingo form. Muho is one part of billion dharmas in the world of form. But at the same time, we're also living emptiness. And form is emptiness. Form is emptiness means that, yes, I'm living this person. But I'm also living emptiness. And this person is one out of many. While emptiness, there can only be one. There's never more than one. 
that's why people sometimes say that when they have this experience of quitting the game that they're one with the universe um, because there's no there's no comparison possible talking like talking about time in the world of form today is October the 7th and it's different from October 6th which which was yesterday and it's different from October 8th that will be tomorrow um, it's probably today is a different day than when you see this video unless you see it already when I upload it but uh, probably you see this video and not on a different day than now when I'm talking to the camera and if the two of us you and I meet in person we will be two different persons Muho will probably not be your man but at the same time I'm doing this on October 7th but I'm also doing this now I'm doing this now and when you watch this it will also be now it will not be the same day not to be the same minute but it's gonna be now and yesterday when I got back from Antaji to Osaka, it was also now. Tomorrow, if I should still sit here, it will be now. Are these the same nows or are they different nows? They are certainly not the same points in time. But when I say it's now, now it is October 7th. This now cannot be compared to yesterday's now or tomorrow's now. It cannot be compared to the now that you live. In this respect, you could say they are not different. You can also not say they are not. They are the same. You cannot say they are different. You cannot say they are the same because there's no compa comparison possible. It's only one. It's only one now. So emptiness as it appears in the Heart Sutra, is basically only a word for here and now, what's happening right now. Or the uh, metaphor that um, Hakuin Zenji uses in his Sazenwa-san, he says, uh, living beings are like ice cubes and Buddha is like water. Basically, emptiness is like water. There's only one body of water. But it's manifesting in this world as ice cubes. There's only one now. But it's manifesting as many different instances. That's why I could also say in a sense that the person who's speaking right now to the camera, or this me, this reality of sitting in front of a camera and speaking the one who says that's my reality cannot be compared to anyone else so you could say it's not different from the same who's also saying now no you are not sitting there now in front of the camera i am sitting right now and watching you on youtube It's not a different me. You can also not say it's the same me because these two me's cannot meet in time and space. We can meet in time and space as persons. But now can never be compared. And this me here can never be compared to another me. It's the self that Uchiyama Roshi would say it's the all out of all while this one here in the center is the so-called small self the one out of all one out of all one of seven one out of seven billions 
but this is all out of all. It's the whole. And there's always only one. There's never a comparison possible. Another thing that's also possible then is uh, practice doesn't end there. Kind of this is the first step. You quit the game, but you always need to return to the game again so there's there's two steps in practice one is down from here letting go of the small self getting acquainted with this bigger reality that you've been living all the time you were never separate from it it's just that you wouldn't see it because you were so focused and absorbed into the game in which it was only about winning or losing for the small figure that seemed to be in the center of the game, the guy who pretended to be the main actor in the movie. You let go of that guy for a while, but then you need to return, eventually you need to return to the game. For example, when you get off the cushion, you're back in the game. You have to play the game again. But you don't want to play it in the same way again. It's not about winning or losing for this one character alone anymore, but you try to play the game in a different way. And how do you do that? Well, you try to live as a bodhisattva. You play the game, but now with new rules. Dogen Zenji says, well, the rules for bodhisattvas, there are, you could say, four. One is giving, dana. Giving means not only letting go of your property and of your time, but it means the realization there actually is nothing that I can call mine. I was talking about my property, but what of this stuff that I wear here did I bring into this world? It was all given to me. The money I own was all given to me. I earn it through my efforts, yeah, but where does, does the strength come from? Where do I have my life from? Where, have I, where do I have my physical existence from? It's all given to me. I'm talking about my time and people make demands on my time. And I hate it when people make demands on my time. My time, 24 hours a day that are given to me. And I complain that people take away my time. So giving means to realize there's actually nothing that I own in the first place. Words of love are the second aspect of a, aspect of a bodhisattva. Um, in the Zen we don't talk, but then when we get off the cushion, we have to relate to people, to connect to people. And words are a very strong way to do it, connect with people with words. The third aspect uh, can be translated as uh, helping others. Um, and again, for that you need to realize actually there are no others. When I help others, I help myself. The fourth aspect then means to make no differences. Don't differentiate. So you realize in, in this game there are no winners and losers, it's, it's only one team. We are all the same team. We are all part of the same team, that's the team of suffering beings. Which when they wake up to the fact that they are parts of that team, can also be the team of the bodhisattvas. It's the same, it's not the bodhisattvas and the suffering beings, but it's one team. Deluded bodhisattvas, awakened suffering beings. beings. Yeah. But then um, all of you who have been living in a Sangha, maybe even a strict uh, Zen monastery, will have learned that actually when you enter that monastery, um, this new game that you're required to play doesn't really sound like the Bodhisattva 
game that you imagine. What happens, for example, you get off the cushion and people tell you please bow here and then turn clockwise and bow there and when you get into the meditation hall go in with the left foot when you go out go out with the right foot and here please arrange your slippers and if you use the toilet please switch out the light if you're the last one and please during the meal put your chopsticks like this 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 when you're in the kitchen you get criticized each day and it never almost never happens that somebody said well you did a really Good job, I really appreciate it. Thank you for that food. So where are these words of love that Dogen is talking about? When are we finally giving something? We are always required to give our all from morning to night. We have to do this, we have to do that. And when do we ever get something back? Losing all the time in the monastery. You're losing all the time. You never do anything right. You always get criticized. And after maybe a couple of months, maybe a year or two, when you finally um, pick up the new rules to a certain degree, which don't seem to be bodhisattva rules, but basically you know, know, learn how to use your bowls and uh, arrange your slippers and to walk quietly on the wooden corridor until you don't crit criticize for making too much noise and being too slow all the time uh, once you get there now people tell you hey why don't you tell your senior uh, your juniors why don't you tell the new monks how to use their bowls and how to arrange their slippers and how, that they should please switch off the lights um, all the stuff that you had to learn and you didn't enjoy the criticism now you have to give the criticism to the others and you they hate you so again you're losing you were losing all the time and now when you finally get less criticism now you have to offer the criticism to others and they hate you so again you're losing you're losing all the time how what has what does this have to do with living your life as a bodhisattva well one thing one difference between this new game that you play in monasteries like Antaiji and the old game that you were playing before is it's not a game about you it's not about the points that you collect you need to forget yourself um, and you just put down the ch chopsticks in the way people you told you to put down the chopsticks and your your eyes are there so practice doesn't mean that you just quit the game and you fade out. If that was the aim of practice, uh, the easiest thing would be to just take a nap. When you take a nap, you take a break from being this person. You don't play the game anymore. When you take a nap, nap you, you disappear from the world for a while. Or taking drugs and, and some people say well why would I make all this effort during meditation if I can just take drugs yes you can take drugs and excuse yourself from the game but probably you can't you're not good at the new game when you're on drugs and when you're asleep you're not part of the new game um, one thing why it's important one reason why it's important to arrange your slippers and to switch out the lights and to walk quietly on the corridor is because you need to keep your eyes open and not only is form emptiness but emptiness is also form it's not that you try to appear disappear from the world of form but you are you have this perspective of emptiness but your eyes are kept firmly on the world of form you see exactly where you stand and where you stand is where the Buddha path begins if you don't see where your slippers are how you left them there well maybe in your mind you're thinking about the Shobo Genzo but that's not where the Shobo Genzo is the Shobo Genzo is right below your feet um, last month I was in Germany and in some spots and in some places where I was uh, there was also a Zen for a day or so I usually gave a talk during these um, 
the Zen meetings and there were questions afterwards and sometimes after the whole thing was finished and we were kind of cleaning up um, some persons stayed behind and they still had questions uh, sometimes a lot of questions um, so I remember this one person that was still asking questions when everybody else around us was already kind of carrying out the cushions and carrying out the altar and stuff like that and you know, things need to take care of then after a while when that person finally had asked her last question she was like maybe maybe I can help you can I help you with something do you need any help which is of course a good question it's in a way it's the bodhisattva question how can I help but the answer honestly is well why couldn't you shut up 30 minutes ago and just step out of the way or if you're really interested in helping us shut up and just see see what everybody else does um, when we eat in the monastery we do it silently and there are all these little complicated rules but actually when you pick up the rules you realize it's much easier for example you don't go like hey would you like some seconds can i serve you a little bit more soup no, you don't want a soup. Are you really sure? Maybe, maybe just a little bit. Uh, we could do it like that, but we don't do it like that. Like you see the guys who have their chopsticks on their bowl, they don't want seconds if somebody takes their chopsticks off. You don't even have to make eye contact at that moment. You know, oh, this guy wants seconds. So you stretch out your hand, and that guy puts the bowl on the hand. Everything goes by itself. All you need to do is have your eyes and ears open and be in your spot and play your role in a game where there's no winner. There's no winner and there's no loser. The problem with playing this bodhisattva game in a kind of into your face, too obvious way, like, can I help you? Can I do something for you? Are you sure you don't need my help? is that there's nothing really wrong with that except that you're mixing this hey i'm willing to help you you need my help are you sure you didn't need my help this here i'm i'm a bodhisattva i'm a bodhisattva i'm a bodhisattva um in the worst case you don't even realize yourself that you're just still playing the old game it's still about you you are at the center of the universe and now you pretend to be the bodhisattva you pretend to have let go of your small deluded ego no it's just that you're wearing this bodhisattva mask um, So for me, Zen practice means to first you quit the game, then, but then you then excuse yourself from the game, maybe for the time of Zen, for one hour, you don't play the game at all. You don't have to worry about anything, except if you're in charge of the bell, you should have your eyes on the clock as well. But apart from that, you can forget your name, you can forget about time, you can forget everything. But when you get back, you have to be also back in the world. You have to remember your name. You have to know the date it is. If you want to harvest rice in the autumn, you have to have planted it in the spring. Although we are living in the eternal now, it doesn't mean that you can get, go to the rice fields any time of the year and there's going to be rice there. Uh, you have to be aware of, is it time to plant now or is it time to weed the rice fields or is it time to harvest and you have to know when it's your job to be in the kitchen and you have to know that if 
lunch has to be on the table at 12, you're the one who needs to do that, otherwise nobody's gonna prepare the lunch for you. There's this funny uh, story of a guy that I also sometimes uh, tell, he was from Germany just like myself, 20 years ago in Atlanta, he uh, went through the training in the kitchen and uh, at one day he was a uh, cook for the first time, just like myself, he was supposed to be uh, making udon noodles for lunch. At 10 o'clock when we had our work break, um, he was uh, relaxing in front of the kitchen and doing some yoga exercises and one of the Japanese uh, senior monks asked him, mm, are you sure you have the time to do yoga right now? Maybe you should uh, get things prepared for lunch. I expect you to have lunch on the table at 12. And I mean, two hours seem to be like a lot of time, but in Antas you have to cook on wooden fire. You have to start the fire in the wooden stove. Um, you have to get for example vegetables for tempura, you have to get those from the vegetable fields you have to harvest as well. So uh, 10 o'clock is a time where actually you should be moving already and get uh, cut, cut vegetables and, and start a fire and heat the oil for tempura frying and stuff like that. And uh, the new cook in the kitchen said don't worry it's gonna be fine, don't worry everything is going to be fine. You will all he have to eat at 12 o'clock. And um, the senior monk was not so convinced. So he checked again at 11 o'clock and as he had worried, as he was afraid uh, to see, he saw the German monk still doing yoga in front of the kitchen. And he gave up on him and said, okay, I'll do it. And uh, with a good amount of effort, he managed to somehow make lunch at 12 o'clock. So at 12 o'clock, he hit the wooden clappers. Everybody came to eat lunch. Also, that young guy who had been doing yoga until then. And after the meal, the senior monk, uh, understandably, was really pissed and say, how? possibly can you do that? You were responsible for cooking and the whole morning I see you enjoying yourselves in the sun doing yoga telling me that everything's gonna be fine but actually it wasn't. If I hadn't cooked we wouldn't have anything to eat. And the young German guy said I don't understand why you're so angry. I told you everything is gonna be fine. At 12 we would have to eat and Everything was fine. Lunch was wonderful. What are you complaining about? In a way, you could say that guy had quit the game. Right, right. He had completely let go of this, this small self of himself. He was one with the universe when he was doing yoga there. And he was probably one with the universe when he sat down at the table and enjoyed the meal. It's just that he failed to also play play one actor in a movie that was not about himself. He played, he failed to play the role in a game that's not about himself, that is not about winning or losing, collecting points for that guy. And um, often when people come to Antaiji, actually it's the second movement, the movement from emptiness back to form, that's harder. Because when people come to a place like Antaiji and they sit down on the cushion, it's usually because they understand this old game that we were all playing in capitalist postmodern society. It's a stupid game. There are only losers. There's only a handful of winners and all the rest of us we can only lose. And it's a waste of time when you realize I'm gonna die. One day the game is going to be over and I can't take these points wherever I go after death. What's the point in, in wasting my whole life trying to like collect imaginary points? 
I want to quit that game. That's why people come to advertise it. When you're actually sitting there during a session, it's not so easy to completely let go. But if you set your mind on it, probably that's the easier step. The harder step is then to say, yeah, I'm gonna engage. I'm gonna engage in the game. I'm gonna be part of the world of form. But it's not about me anymore. It's not about the points. It's not about winning. But still, that's where I put my mind. That's where I put my energy. That's where I invest my life. And that's how you create Antaiji. You have to first realize it's not about you. And then can you can create the universe. Then you are finally in the position to create the universe. A universe that's not about you. Um, there's a very famous Vietnamese monk. All of you know the name Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, around 30 years ago or so he started to become popular. popular. Uh, one thing that he said at the time that he maybe still says is um, there's this Buddhist teaching. Mm, in English it's interbeing. In, you don't find it in the dictionary but it should be in the dictionary. Hopefully at one day you will find this word interbeing in the dictionary. And I always wondered already 30 years ago, why doesn't anybody take, tell Thich Nhat Hanh that the word actually is in the dictionary? It has been in the dictionary for a very long time. Um, in German, and I could imagine in quite a good amount of other um, of European languages, that's, this is the word, interesse. Interesse. Inter means, well, in between, well, things that are connected. And esse means being. And in, in English, for some reason, that's inter est, interest. Est being the third person singular. So be, basically, it's inter be. Um, and often we don't use the word, not in its original sense. So um, in English, for example, you have interest rates. Um, where we're talking again about this game of winning and losing. People are interested when there's something in there for them. If they can make a profit, then they call it an interest. Or if it's a game between two, two teams and I root for one of those teams, I get interested in the game. Um, but the original meaning of interest or interesse is basically what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. That the realization that you're never, you were never separate from the game. Um, you show interest. You still show interest in the game when it, when even after you realize it's not about you. It's easy for us to be interested when we think we can gain something, when we still have the illusion it's all about collecting points. It's also not so difficult to make that first step of spiritual practice after you realize, oh, there's nothing really for me to win here, so I excuse myself from the game. You practice a Zen as other people take a nap or take drugs. You fade out. You lose interest in the game. When people serve you lunch, okay, you eat that. And as long as it's a vegan meal, of course. Uh, you don't want to eat any meal, you don't want to eat any meat or fish. Uh, uh, you eat your vegan meal and you close your eyes and you chew on that raisin for an hour, completely mindful, and then you fade out of the game again. But that's not what 
real interbeing is. You need to show interest in the slippers that you just left at the door. You need to be interested in the question, is there still somebody in the toilet? If yes, I should leave the lights on. If no, I need to switch it out. Does my neighbor want seconds on the soup? If yes, I'm the one who needs to serve him. I could ask him, do you want more soup? But maybe I don't even have to ask. Maybe I just take a look. Maybe I just shut up and <clears throat> keep my eyes on the game. I'm interested. I'm interested in that game that seemed so boring until now. But once you realize you don't have to play it with the old rules, there are different ways to play that game. Um, it gets more interesting. Although from my experience, uh, even after years of practice, it's not so easy as sometimes people make it sound. Um, there's also something somebody asked me after the session then. Um, he told me that Zen masters often they look tense to him, while in other traditions the teachers seem to be much more relaxed and at peace with themselves and the universe. How come that he doesn't find that with Zen master so much? Um, what I told him at the time when I told him after session when he asked this question is well maybe that's because um, these teachers that seem to be very relaxed and at peace with the universe have a team of people around them that take all the stress um, like I'm not completely relaxed and at peace right now but I feel much more relaxed for example than 13 years ago um, the visitor that came for the session the last time he wasn't under he was uh, well the first time wasn't 30 years ago 13 years ago and he didn't come for decades so I asked him well how would you say how do you find me 13 years ago now uh, compared I feel that I'm much relaxed more relaxed now than compared to 13 years ago and he says yeah I agree also untidy seems to be completely different the reason why I couldn't relax 13 years ago is where I was not only the abbot, but I was also the first monk. I was basically the only one who had stayed there for more than a year. So, so basically, I had to do everything. I was a one-man monastery. And now, I know I have a successor. She's a tough woman. And for a couple of years now, she is done most of the stuff that I had to do by myself for 13 years and she probably to most people doesn't look like the most relaxed and at peace with herself and the universe person because she is basically there where I was 18 years ago right at the start um, but if you take that stress, that means that you allow others to maybe be more peaceful. Like for example, if you're a doctor or you're in some other helping provision, profession and you say, I work only two hours a day from Monday to Friday, um, it's probably gonna help you to not burn out. And you say, apart from that, the door is closed, I don't pick up the phone and maybe it's, it's gonna help you um, to be also good at your profession but for your patients it might be a little bit um, a reason to be anxious because they know well I have only two hours per day and there's a long 
line of people lining up in front of my doctor's office and if I don't make it into the office on that day I have to wait for another day and if I don't make it in by Friday nobody's gonna help me until Monday if on the other day you on the other hand you say my door is open all the time and you can call me 24 hours a day life is not gonna be so easy for you but maybe you can help others unless you burn out of course so so in reality you always have at some point to draw a line and say sorry now i need to go to sleep um uh, but i have uh, the suspicion that for example even the dalai lama wouldn't be so peaceful and relaxed and one with the universe if he had to book all his flights by himself and make sure that he has something to eat at the end of the day and do his own laundry and all of that he has a team of people who arrange everything for him so he can be relaxed and uh, be the peaceful smiling Dalai Lama when he gives an interview for example Mm, Dogen Zenji in a chapter that's called Shoji Life and Death, um, the second to last uh, paragraph is very famous. He writes something there that also brings us back to what I said before the session, kind of letting go, dying on the cushion. He says there famously, when you let go of your body and mind and forget them completely, and you throw yourself into the Buddha's abode. Then everything is done from the side of Buddha and you just follow along without effort or anxiety. You break free from life's suffering and are Buddha yourself. How can you then have any hindrance in your mind? In the Genjo Koan chapter, he puts it a little bit different, but I think he's basically saying the same there when he says to study the Buddha way means to study yourself. To study yourself means to forget yourself. To forget yourself means to be manifested by the 10,000 things you realize when you encounter the 10,000 10, 10, things phenomena that's actually you kind of that's basically this realization if you forget about the self here and you realize the 10,000 things that I saw here they're all part of myself form is emptiness forget yourself means to be experienced by the 10,000 things and to experience the 10,000 things as yourself and that again means to let go of your body and mind and the body of mind of others. All traces of enlightenment will disappear, but these invisible traces will continue on and on. And while Dogen Zenji emphasizes here very strongly that it's done without effort or anxiety, so you don't have to fight to do that you just let go and everything is going to be done from the side of Buddha um, so back to this question the, the question that I got after session was basically um, that person said I also, I also had moments like this in the past where I just let go and it seemed to be easy but it didn't continue for so long at least in theory it should be possible to get into the state and then it should continue forever i believe that's in the, the case in with enlightened people uh, i would imagine that an enlightened master is always in this state where without any effort he quits the game and then also participates again in the game as a bodhisattva he doesn't have to push himself to be a bodhisattva he hasn't 
doesn't have to force himself. Um, that's what we would expect. But interestingly, after the second to last paragraph, Dogen Zenji adds one more, one last paragraph, and that starts like this. I'm quoting from the Antaji homepage, Shoji chapter. You find this in the Dharma section. If you click on the Dharma button, there's uh, another button below there, Classics, and then you go to Shoji. The end of the page, you think you find the last paragraph, which reads, There is a very easy way to be a Buddha. It's kind of strange that Buddha, that Dogen Zenji would write this because he already explained how to become a Buddha. He said you just have to forget yourself, throw yourself into the abode of the Buddha, then everything is going to be done from the side of the Buddha. You don't need to make any effort, no anxiety. You're going to be liberated from life suffering and be a Buddha yourself. You already explained that, so why would Dogen think it's necessary to make any addition to that? Why would he say now there's a very easy way to be a Buddha? How could be anything easier than to just let go and leave everything to the activity of Buddha? So what's that very easy way that Dogen thinks is necessary to teach? at the end. Uh, first, do not do any evil. Why would he say that now? If everything, I, if I leave everything to the activity of Buddha, Buddha wouldn't do anything evil with this body, with my mind. Buddha wouldn't allow me to do anything evil, would he? How would I even feel any temptation to do anything evil after having let completely let go, after I quit this game of winning and losing, why would I do anything evil? Strange, isn't it? Do not try to cling to life and death, but with deep compassion work for all beings. Why? I already let go of life and death. Why should I cling to it? I already understood that there's no separation between and me and the universe. So naturally I should have this compassion for all living beings. I mean, there's no difference. I already realized, I understand. We are all one. We are all one. Why would I not have compassion? Respect your elders and sympathize with those younger. Why would differences like older and younger, senior and junior even matter now? Should respect not be mutual? And again, it should happen naturally. When you do neither deny things nor seek them or think and worry about them, then you are called a Buddha. Don't look for anything else. That's how the chapter ends. And this last chapter, it's kind of confusing what he says there. It's what you would call, what you, what you would teach an elementary school kid. To not do evil be nice to others, to show respect to the parents and the teachers, to sympathize to it with its younger siblings, to be nice to its younger brother and sister, help those, to not always wish for this or that, but be content what appears on the table, eat what is on the table, um, do your homework, and don't worry too much, don't be afraid of the dark. Still, Dogen Zenji felt it necessary to write this last paragraph. Why? And uh, the reason why I think he wrote this paragraph is the following. The first paragraph is important. And it is about this moment of letting go. 
you completely quit the game and that moment you realize why why didn't i realize earlier What was all this suffering about? I was, I thought I lived in this world of suffering, but actually, no problem. There wasn't really a problem. Except the problems created by the small me. But even those problems were nobody, no one's really, no one's problems, actually. You let go and you realize, wow, it was so easy. That was easy. Why didn't I do that earlier? Um, sometimes this experience reminds me of well, the experience of my first kiss. I'd been wishing for a girlfriend for so long, but never could have one. All my friends started to have girlfriends, or dating girlfriends, and I didn't have one. And uh, one day, it was just when I got into high school, and there was this beautiful girl sitting at the desk, desk next to me, but I was too shy. I was too shy to talk to her. But thinking of her when I was sitting in my room. And one day was knocking on the door and there she stood and asked, can I come in? And I said, yes, of course, please take a seat and so we were sitting on the bed next to each other talking with each other and after a while we had nothing to talk about anymore and I started to draw a picture for her on my block and she was watching me draw there and after a while I realized she her head is on my shoulder maybe she fell asleep maybe she she got bored, I had nothing to tell her anymore. She got bored with me drawing this picture. And when I turned my head, out of a sudden she kissed me. And yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I never had the courage. I never had had the courage. Um, but it came. In, in a way it came from the side of the Buddha. It came from the side of the Buddha. There was no effort from my side. No anxiety. And the world was different. The world was different. It was so easy. And now we were girlfriend and boyfriend. And I was sure we would stay together for the rest of our lives and would be happy forever. And it was quite nice for several weeks, months, but then it also got harder. Actually we kind of mm, got along for e with each other for on and off were well, all together kind of eight years. But it wasn't always easy. And now I'm married with kids and with my wife, of course, also 18 years ago. I fell in love with her when I was in Osaka sitting in the park. I fell in love with this cute girl that came to the Zazen sittings and stayed afterwards for talks. We fell in love with each other, but now we are married. Where did this initial feeling of being in love go? At least in theory, it should be possible to preserve this feeling of being in love forever. Maybe enlightened masters can do it. I doubt. I doubt. I guess that even enlightened masters 
in the beginning it feels like the first kiss with Buddha. You're in love with the whole universe. You're dating all sentient beings and it's wonderful. But when you're married to the Buddha and you have all the sentient beings as your kids and they cry and they demand your time and your attention and everybody wants to be the center of the universe but they cannot be the center of the universe as persons they can only be the center of the universe or they can only have this realization that they always were the center of the universe right from the start when they forget about their personal selves just as we need to forget about October the 7th to realize we were never outside of the now it was always now there was never any other moment of time than now but we all too soon locate your, well, ourselves on October 7th and we say oh it's only one day out of 365 in the year and if I live up to 80 it's gonna be one out of 30,000 days in my life it's not much if I think about the history of time it's really nothing and in the same way if you think about Muho as one out of seven billion people he could have died last year it wouldn't really have mattered well it would have mattered for me now have mattered quite a lot um, and that's what a bodhisattva tries to teach others yes you are the center of the universe but not this phenomenal person so especially in a monastic environment What you do is quite a lot of denial and tell your people, hey, it's not about you. Please make lunch until 12 and make sure the noodles are just right. And arrange your slippers. And if the others don't do that, don't arrange theirs, then either tell them or do it for them. Um, but sooner or later you have to tell it to the others too so you have to let go of yourself and also try to motivate others to do the same and that's not always easy it's it's like being married at first it's like being in love for the first time But I don't think you can sustain that being in loveness when you're back in the game and you're again playing this person and you're losing, losing, losing and you try to be okay with that but sometimes you feel I don't have any companions here that help me with that game that's not so easy. Like for example, there's the story of, of Dogen that's after he went to Eiji. So he made this big resolution to leave Kohoji in Kyoto, leave the capital, go into the mountains, maybe die there. Um, but then he was invited to the new capital, Kamakura, where all the shogun sat. Um, and maybe reluctantly he agreed to go there. Again saying well sitting here alone with the community in the mountains alone is not practice i also need to share this i have to go out into the world if people want me to teach them down there in kamakula let's go so he took uh, one of his students i think his name was genyo Genyo, with him and he lived there uh, but after one year decided to go back to Eheji. So in Kamakura he was only one year and he seemed it seems that Dogen Zenji didn't really think that that one year was so rewarding and meaningful for him. 
and it's not quite clear uh, what really happened, but maybe one of Dogen's supporters in Kamakura gave his student, his assistant, Gemyo, some money when they returned to, Kama uh, to Eheji for the purpose of the monastery, for the Sangha probably. And I don't know, nobody knows if it was the fact that Gemyo took that money for the Sangha or maybe he didn't use it in the right way. But Dogen, quite soon after he returned to Eiji with Gemyo, got very pissed with his students and told him to leave. And not only did he tell him to leave, but um, he told the other monks to remove the platform on which Jürgen had meditated for all those years. So the Jürgen's meditation platform was removed. And not only that, Dogen Zenji told the other monks to dig six foot deep, almost two meters deep. Uh, remove the soil and throw it away outside of the monastery precincts uh, and fill that hole anew. So Dogen must have been really pissed at the time. And of course you could say, well, maybe in his mind he wasn't really so angry. Maybe he just did that to make a point there and he, he tried to teach also the other monks a lesson. But I doubt it. I could imagine that a Dogen um, was not always at peace with himself and the universe all of the time. When he closely to his death left again Eiji to go to Kyoto hoping for treatment but then could find treatment and died not in Eiji but separated separated from the Sangha in Kyoto who knows who knows if he felt I did the right thing because all I did was letting go and everything was done from the side of the Buddha. No need for my own effort, no need for anxiety. I could uh, imagine that uh, even Dogen, after gotten enlightened in China and getting back to Japan from time to time, had to remind himself, do not do any evil. Do not try to cling to life and death but with deep compassion work for all beings. So this idea that we need to let go once and then we're going to be in love with the universe forever and ever, I think it's an illusion, an illusion we have to wake up from. Okay, um, so much from my side, uh, one and a half hours talk in English. Um, you're gonna hear again from me. Uh, those who have noticed, uh, I also uploaded two new texts of the My Teacher's House series. I haven't commented them yet, yet but there's two new texts on the Antaji homepage if you go there. Uh, Muho essays uh, will take you to a page where you can read the whole My Teacher's House series. I will comment on these texts at one point. And again, at the end of the month, I'm gonna give a talk in Antaiji before the November session. We expect almost 20 participants, uh, most of them non-Japanese so I'm gonna take give a talk in English again and hopefully then the com camera will work so you will have uh, the original talk then uh, in Antaiji but as you might have noticed already uh, most of the talks are basically about the same point I, I keep saying the same things over and over again so there's not much new 
under the sun. <laughs> okay, um, so much for today. Enjoy yourselves. Keep it. Take care and maintain the practice from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. And it's not easy, at least it's not easy for me. So if you feel it's not easy for you, you're not the only one.